Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Warburton. I'm the coordinator of faculty fellows in the speaker series. And remember, we are sponsored by the Dean of Students Office, the bookstore, and the Student Union. They're very helpful with everything we do here. So thank you all for coming today. We're also being filmed for UA Channel. So it airs on Monday night at 8 o'clock. And then the repeat would be the next Sunday at 2 o'clock. So if you want to see it on television, see it again, please feel free to do that. UA Channel is very helpful with filming all these events. It's with great pleasure today I get to introduce Dr. Coates. Dr. Wayne Coates got his PhD from Oklahoma State in 1973. And he had undergraduate degrees. He's published over 40 different articles um, in various science journals. But the thing that's interesting about him is not so much his background, but he's a runner. He loves to run. He does marathons. He does uh, 100 miles, he's doing 100 mile in October, and he's an avid runner up and down hills and things like that, so that's kind of an interesting fact about him. So afterwards, if you have questions, would you please come to the microphone to ask your questions so that we can make sure we get it on the air, uh, the questions. So if you have any questions afterwards, please feel free, and let me introduce Dr. Wayne Coates. Thank you. Um, I do eat chia on my runs, and we'll talk about why in a little bit. Um, to begin with, I want to acknowledge my fellow author, Ricardo Yerza. He's an adjunct faculty here at the university as well. He lives in Buenos Aires. He and I have worked together on new crops for uh, more than 15 years now. And what I'm going to do today is talk about chia. I'm going to talk a little bit of the history of what's happened in the past with chia. And I'm going to talk about why it's important or becoming important today and primarily that's because of what it contains, and that is the omega-3 fatty acids. And we'll get into that as we go along here. This is a book that recently was published by the University of Arizona Press. It's available in the bookstore. If you're interested in more information on chia, this is ba basically a compendium of all the information in the world on chia that we could put together. The book came out earlier this year. To give you an idea, this is what a uh, seed head of chia looks like. Uh, beautiful purple flowers, purple-blue flowers. Looks much like a seed head on a, on a wheat, if you will. The plants are very dark green. It's, when the field is growing, it's very beautiful, and especially when it's in flower stage. This happens to be a mature plant, would be ready to harvest. This is a very large one. They're not normally that. They're multi-stemmed, unlike wheat. Wheat basically has one wheat or stem stalk and uh, one seed head. And this happens to be the father of one of the uh, fellows in Argentina where we started to grow chia about uh, 10 years, 15 years ago now. Let's start with a little history of chia. It was one of the most important crops of the Aztecs. They had corn, beans, chia, and amaranth in that order. So chia, the Aztecs used it for a number of things. We're going to talk about that. And the reason we know about the Aztecs is because of these books called codices or codex that were written uh, right after the Spanish conquest. They were done in about the 15, middle 1500s. And a lot of them were destroyed, but a number of them have survived. And a couple of the most uh, notable are the codex, codex Mendoza, which was written 1541-42, and the Codex Florentino in 1579. And we'll talk a little bit about what we know from that period of time. If you look at, at this slide, this is actually a page from the Codex Mendoza. The arrow on the left here points to where they're talking about chia. And this actually talks about the amount of tributes that were paid from the conquered nations to the Aztecs. It's interesting that these colors are actual colors. This hasn't been colored or anything else. This is the way this document appears today. I forget where this is housed. I believe this one is in Spain. 
But these colors are preserved because of using the oil of chia. So it's got some other properties we'll talk about. This just shows a picture from the Codex Florentino, and you'll see a person there on their knees, and that's a plant of chia. And if you'll remember the photo I showed earlier of a ripe plant of chia, this would be similar. So they, they, it was well documented. Where does chia come from? Basically, it comes from the same area they think the Aztecs came from. And if we want to talk about common or current day geography, it's southern Mexico and northern Guatemala. So that's its native zone. And we'll see something about, talk about later why then we cannot grow it in the US. And it's because where it grows uh, naturally. How did the uh, Aztecs use chia? They use it as a food. They had many documented medicinal purposes and other things. And we'll go through a few of these here to give you an idea of, of how the chia was used and how important it was. In their foods, they mixed it with other foods, like with amaranth, after they roasted them together, it was called tazole. That's the word. These are Natal words, or the native language of the Aztecs. Um, they mixed it in water and consumed it as, as a beverage. Today in Mexico, in some parts of Mexico, and even here in Tucson, you will see people drinking a drink, and it's called chia fresca, and they drink it on hot days. But the Aztecs did it way back when. Atoli was a gruel they made from vegetable flour, which included chia. They ground it into flour and made a number of things. They actually, in their markets, this was documented by the Spanish. They had bars, much like our health bars today. The chia was in there, there was almonds, and there was a syrup, and formed into bars. And the issue, they carried it on long trips, and it served as a high energy food. So all their warriors, when they were on their campaigns, used to carry this. And I said uh, a few minutes ago, I said I carry it on my runs. And I do that because of its composition. It digests slowly and has a lot of energy associated with it. In terms of the Aztecs and some of the medicines or the medicinal purposes they used, and these were translated from the Natal language. It's uh, one of the things it says, it's required by one who spits blood who coughs constantly, cures a dry cough, dislodges the flux, clears the chest. So clearly they were using it for some type of uh, lung pulmonary issues. From another codex, which was written 1576, they're talking about it ground and mixed with other plants when the flow of urine is cut off. So whether this was bladder, kidney, we really don't know. But these were some of the ways. And we don't know exactly how else they were used or how they were mixed, but this gives some other ideas. From another. Uh, book that was written in the 1500s, taken without chili, the high temperature of the body is relieved. So when a person had fever, it was consumed. And a much later book, 1874, talks about it. They listed it as an emollient. When you have something in your eye, chia has soluble fiber. If you put it in water, what happens is soluble fiber comes out. They put it in the eye, the moisture in the eye. What that would do would go around the particle, and they were able to lift the particle out of the eye. So it's very interesting uses. They fed it to their animals. Their, they had pet birds. They fed it to their livestock, what they raised. They also pressed it for the oil. And I showed you the picture earlier from the one codex. And they used it as the base then for face and body paints. And in the, the known, it was known as Chia Matal in the Natal language. They used it to protect their religious statues and paintings from the elements. And that statement here is illustrations on the 1579 codex. They are as brilliant. You can tell that. That was not touched up. It's still used today. The oil from chia is still used to protect the maque, the, the flowers that are produced in, in Mexico, in parts of Mexico. They've tried other oils. They did not work as well as the chia oil. The Mayans. They were, had chia. They were involved with chia. We're not exactly sure how they got it. but. It was located in what was the ancient, uh, the Chiapas zone. And you might have heard of the Chiapas uh, zone, is where the Mayans were. And derives the name from the Natal, or the Indian word, Chia Napan, which means Chia River or Chia Water. And in this region today, they have a drink called Tazcalate, however you say it, in their native language, or Agua de Chia or Chia Fresca. So they were using it very similar. We think what has happened is the Aztecs and the Mayans had commerce back and forth. We can't find that they produced it more that the Aztecs were uh, giving it through a trade agreement of some kind. 
So it was really, really important to the Aztecs. There's no, there's no question about that. And the question then became, why did it disappear? All of a sudden, it was gone. And prior to the 1990s, when we started this work, it was grown in a very few small plots, primarily in isolated villages, more so in the mountainous regions of Mexico and in northern Guatemala. And it was really just a specialty food. You could buy it in a few markets, and there were, it was available here in the US in a couple of places, but very, very limited scale. This is what we think is the reason why it disappeared. First of all, when the Europeans came, they wanted the foods they were familiar with grown in Mexico, their, car, their, uh, their wheats and the rice and some of these things. And of the four major crops that the Aztecs did grow, only corn, beans, and amaranth survived because you can grow them in Europe. You cannot grow chia in Europe. So the, the Spanish said, we don't want this, we can't grow it, blah, blah, blah. That's one reason. The other is the religious persecution. One of the main ceremonies of the Aztecs took place every year right around our Easter. They made statues out of the dough from, made from the chia. At the end of the service, what they would do is break the statues out and give it much out like communion in the, in the Catholic faith. Well, the friars saw this and they said, they were just horrified by this. They, they were sure there was some interaction and they didn't know what was going on. We can't find that it was outlawed, but basically it was pushed aside and it, it really truly just about disappeared totally. We got involved in this in 1990-91 with a project called the Northwestern Argentina Regional Project. And what our goal was, uh, was to help diversify agricultural production in the northwest of Argentina. One of their main crops there is tobacco, the second one would be beans. This involved the U of A, University of California, a uh, number of organizations in the U.S. and Argentina, with the principal source of funding came from what uh, an organization called Partners of the Americas, with the money coming from the 1990 Farm Bill. The Partners of the Americas basically sends experts uh, to these locations to help with various uh, agricultural issues. What we started with was planting a number of crops. She happened to be one of them at that time. We saw it did well. We developed agronomic practices because in order for any crop to survive today, unless it's a very specialty thing, you've got to be able to do it commercially. You've got to be able to plant it on a large scale, harvest large scale, and so on and so forth. And it has gone from 1990 to today in 15 years that it's commercially grown in Argentina and in Bolivia. We also produced it in Peru, and we produced it in uh, uh, Colombia as well, and it does well there. So we've taken it now to a point that it can be commercially grown. One of the questions that comes up through some of the discussions we've had is which is the, quote, real chia? You'll see people talk about, yeah, I've seen chia growing in um, Southern California, Baja, California. That is a chia, but it's not the same one. What we're discussing here is Salvia Hispanica, which is, will not grow in Baja, California. What's grown over in that part of the world is the Salvia columbarii, and it's native to Arizona in the Southwest. It's called chia, but it has very different characteristics. So that's not what we're talking about, and it's, it is not being commercially grown. You can find it in a few stores, but it's on a berry because it's hand harvested from the wild. This shows a field, one of the early fields in Argentina, Catamarca, Argentina. In the foreground here is a field of chia. It's not in bloom yet. And in the background are the mountains surrounding the city called Catamarca. This zone is very, very similar to Tucson. It's a city surrounded by mountains. They're a little taller than we have here. But they have a cactus identical to our saguaro. They have mesquite trees. They have the creosote bush. The, the climate is almost identical. So it's kind of an interesting comparison. We started our work in that particular area and had to move farther north because there were some issues with growing it there. If we talk about chia production, it needs tropical, subtropical. Remember, it's from the south of Mexico, so basically between 23 degrees latitude and 23 and 23. It needs sandy loam soils. It's got to be reasonably well drained. 
Insects have never been a problem. It's actually a member of the mint family. And any of you who've grown mint, you know mint is very strong flavor. Insects don't bother mint at all either. We've never had to spray uh, at all for insects, which is very good. But here's the key thing about chia production. It's what we call day length sensitive. Doesn't matter when you plant it, until the days get certain short, around 12 hours or so, that's when triggers the flowering. Here last year we planted some and it was October 18th this started to flower. It's very sensitive to frost. What happens, it's starting to mature, the seeds are developing, we had a little frost and that was the end of it. And that's why we can't grow it in the continental U.S. Probably in Hawaii we could. There might be in the south of Florida, the south of Texas, but the issues would be would a farmer want to risk losing it all? So it really can't grow here. Normal life cycle, 90 to 150 days. And that's, uh, that's the situation. So we are producing it now in northern Argentina and, Bol and Bolivia. And like I say, we, it's the gr farmers group, group, really, we started to work with. Yields, get 2,500 kilograms per acre in, or hectare in plots. Normally in commercial fields, are 600 to 1,000. This is commercially viable. We want to work more on the agronomics to increase the yields. One of the things that's interesting, this is true of any oil crop. Depending on the climate, where you grow it, when it's planted, you can actually change the oil composition and content. If you have cooler nights, you're going to have higher oil content, and in this case, we're going to have our, more omega-3s. We harvest it with a combine, very similar to the, the same machine that you use for wheat or other grain crops, some modifications. We clean it with traditional seed cleaning equipment, and there is oil available on the market, and you just cold press it. It's not solvent extracted, so it's, it's uh, pure and clean oil. So basically, the production can be done with existing equipment. Okay, we're going to switch a little bit here now and talk about, well, so what's the big deal about chia? Why is it important? And it goes back to this omega-3 issue. And we'll talk a little bit about 